The desire to meet and have an intimate relationship with someone. To go out there and find someone with whom you'd love to share the special moments of your life is one of the many things that drives many young people into unhealthy relationships. Get this. The desire to give and receive love is not evil in itself. It's one of the characteristics that make you a human being, made in God's image. God, your Heavenly Father, also has the desire to express and receive love. The Bible says that He loved the world so much that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus. The Bible also says that God expects us to love Him and express our love for Him in worship and in good deeds towards others. So it's not a corrupt desire to want to have someone to love and to be loved. However, if the desire is left unchecked, it can produce impatience. And herein lies the problem. Many young people have come out of a failed relationship with one realization. They entered it too fast. If you fail to wait patiently for the person you love or for the person God wants you to be with, you most likely will end up living the rest of your life in regret. Do you know that you can love someone, but somehow something just keeps the two of you apart? Do you know that sometimes we think it's a sign that God doesn't want us to be with the person? But that's not true. The truth is that it's possible that God's telling you to wait patiently for the person and for the perfect time. If you're unable to understand God's timing, you'll rush into it and mess things up in both of your lives. God's using this message to tell you to wait, my friend. Impatience will always give birth to premature miracles. What are premature miracles? There are those things that you may receive that look like what you've been waiting for, coming earlier than they should, and causing more damage than good in your life. Realize this, no number of premature miracles will ever be able to produce the same effect they should if they'd come at the right time. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.1, There is a season, a time appointed for everything, and a time for every delight and event or purpose under heaven. Then in verse 11 of the same chapter it says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Take note that the Bible says everything is beautiful only in its own time, not in yours, but in its. You know, the fact that you found someone to love or that you feel that you're ready to be with someone does not guarantee that God wants you to be with someone at that time. Sometimes, someone may be available in your life, yet God would tell you that it's not time yet. Why? Because God knows things you don't. Ecclesiastes 3 tells us that although God puts a desire for the future in our hearts, He makes it impossible for the human mind to understand what lies ahead. But you may wonder, why can we have memories of the past, but never a vivid idea of the future? We may predict or even by prophecy or vision have a glimpse of the future, but never a full picture. Why? Because God wants us to trust Him with it. Another reason is because many of us would certainly fall into depression, fear, or anxiety, or even die if God showed us what lies ahead. Can you imagine some of the darkest moments you've had to go through in life? What would you have done if you had known they were coming? How would you have prepared? Yes, there are things you would have avoided. But how would you have prepared yourself knowing that you can't avoid some other things if you want to get to a certain point in your life? Do you know that some people are designed to go through certain moments in their lives because of the kind of destiny they have? Jesus is a perfect example. He was born for a reason. He went to the cross for that reason. At a point, because he was God, he could tell what was ahead, and his humanity responded. He prayed for it to be averted, but again he prayed that it remained. God wants us to trust in his word and love for us. His ways are not your ways. He doesn't see or think like you do. He doesn't use your clock, so you shouldn't time him. Rather, he wants you to believe that his thoughts concerning you are good thoughts. So even if you can't see what lies ahead, you can believe that no matter what you face, he will be with you and give you a future that will be peaceful. One reason God may be telling you to wait patiently for the person you love 
may be for him to carry out or finish a particular work in the life of the person you love. This is one of the most overlooked matters in Christian relationships. Most single believers believe that as long as someone is a Christian, they're good for you. That is not true. We're all a work in progress. This means that the person you love is as imperfect as you are. God's working on them as he is with you. So sometimes he asks you to wait, not because he doesn't trust you and not because you're not ready, but because they aren't. A person may look good or even perfect on the outside, but the truth is that they may be going through a difficult time on the inside. They may be dealing with traumas that would hurt you, even if you think you can manage it. Relationships are not a cure for certain things. Only Jesus can heal broken hearts. New relationships can't. Hence, instead of overthinking or getting impatient about the person you love, you can pray for them. Ask God to prepare them for you. Ask Him to perfect what He has started in their lives. Ask Him for grace to be patient with them. And pray that God will connect you to when the time is right. With such a heart, you overcome the pressures of impatience. And you also prove to them that what you have for them is beyond your feelings or what you want to gain from them. You're more interested in the value your life gives them than how you benefit from them. So, apart from the time not being right or them not being ready, God may be telling you to wait patiently for the person you love because He needs to develop you to be the right man or woman for that person. Many of us are walking around with burdens, wounds, and experiences that have affected us and are influencing us to become someone other than the person we're meant to be. Many young people are aware of this and try to find someone who's in great shape to hide with, believing that with this person they'll heal and be compensated for their pain. My friend, marriage is not meant to be a compensation for the sufferings you've gone through in life. You have to be whole to be ready for a future with someone. You can't carry certain unhealthy practices about and expect God to give you a man or woman he's been working on freeing for years. This is why whenever God tells you or shows you that you have to wait patiently, you must trust Him. You may be the reason for His decision. However, at the end, trusting God's timing is more an act of submission to God than anything else. It takes a great amount of submission to wait on God and not take any steps, especially when your desires are screaming for you to take action. So, what should you do while you wait on God for the person you love? Pray more. More time in prayer is a blessed investment you're making in your spirit. It increases your ability to hear and know what God is saying over time. You're more likely to find peace and assurance when you pray often than when you don't. Secondly, while you wait, commit yourself to renewing your mind. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide your thoughts in a healthy direction regarding this person. Let God use the delay in His instructions in waiting to break certain ideas you've held on to in the past about marriage. Beyond sex, meeting your financial needs, or just emotional satisfaction, marriage is a spiritual institution that's rooted in God and in His will for your destiny. Finally, as you wait for God's perfect time for you to be with the person you love, develop yourself further in spirit and in other areas required. Learn different useful skills, both professional and personal skills. Learn skills that will improve your economic life and also learn skills that will contribute to your communication with each other. These are intentional things you can do in obedience to God as you make yourself useful in preparing for the right person He has for you. God is never late. Trust His timing you'll be glad you did. You know that feeling when you finally find that special someone you've been praying for? It's like a euphoric high that makes you want to shout it from the rooftops. But hold on a minute, brothers and sisters. Before you go telling everyone and their grandma about your new relationship, you need to keep your mouth shut. Let me break it down for you. The Bible talks about enemies, evil hearts, and they're not just the same abstract concept. 
No, they're real, and they're lurking all around us. You may think that everyone around you is on your side, but the truth is, not everyone is happy for your blessings. Some people will smile to your face while secretly wishing for your downfall. And the last thing you want is for your good news to get back to those who want to see you fail. Don't be naive, my friends. Don't think that just because someone calls themselves your friend means they have your best interests at heart. Keep your circle tight and only share your blessings with those who have proven themselves to be trustworthy. And let me tell you, when you're living your best life and your cup runneth over, your enemies will be watching. They'll be waiting for you to slip up, waiting for a chance to tear you down. But you know what? The Bible tells us to love our enemies, bless those who curse us, and pray for those who spitefully use us. It's not easy, but it is necessary. So when God blesses you with a new relationship, keep your mouth shut. Guard your blessings like precious jewels and only share them with those who deserve to know. Remember, we live in a world of evil eyes and jealousy, but with God on your side, you can overcome anything. Stay strong, stay faithful, and keep your mouth shut. We live in a world full of enemies, enemies who are not always obvious, enemies who pretend to like us but secretly hate us. Jesus himself had enemies and he was perfect. So what makes us think we won't have any? Now I know some of you are probably thinking, I don't have any enemies. <laughs> well, my friend, wake up and smell the coffee because you do. They might not be obvious, and you might not even know who they are yet, but they exist. This world is full of jealousy, envy, and misunderstandings, and unfortunately, humans are complicated creatures. You can't just look at someone and know whether they like you or not like dogs. Dogs will either like you or not, no in-betweens, but humans, they smile to your face and stab you in the back as soon as you turn around. So why am I telling you all of this? Because your relationship might be an encouragement for some, but for others, it's a reason to hate you. Yes, you heard me right. Your new relationship could be the thing that someone out there despises you for. They'll pretend to be happy for you, but deep down, their anger will fester in their heart. It's a cruel reality, but it's the truth. So what can you do about it? Well, for starters, keep your mouth shut. Don't go around flaunting your new relationship to everyone who will listen. Keep it to yourself and only share the news with those who genuinely care about you. Don't post every little detail on social media either because you'd never know who's watching and waiting for an opportunity to bring you down. Be careful who you share your relationship with. Not everyone has your best interest at heart, and some people are just waiting for the chance to see you fall. So enjoy your new relationship, but keep it low key. Trust me, it's for your own good. So you've just entered a new relationship and you're over the moon about it. You can't wait to tell everyone about how blessed you are and have found your soulmate. But before you go running your mouth about the ins and outs of your new boo, let's pump the brakes for a second and use some wisdom. You don't want to put yourself in a position where you're vulnerable to the evil lurking in the world. Trust me, the world we live in is no joke. There are people out there who will smile in your face and stab you in the back the second they get the chance. You might not even realize it until it's too late. Take Joseph from the Bible, for example. This dude had a dream that his brothers would bow down to him one day. And you know what they did? They threw him in a well and sold him into slavery. But as we know, God has a way of turning even the worst situations around for our good. Joseph went from slave to leader, and it was all because he kept his mouth shut about his dreams. The same goes for you and your new relationship. Who are you telling about your blessings? Do these people really have your best interests at heart? Or are they secretly praying for your downfall? When you get into an argument with your partner, it might be tempting to vent to your friends or family, but be careful who you share with. Sometimes the people we think are on our side 
are really just waiting for us to slip up so they can say, I told you so. Let's be real. When we're angry, we tend to talk even more. We have all these emotions and we just need someone to listen. But here's the thing. Sometimes it's better to just be quiet. Take a step back, breathe, and think about what you want to say before you say it. And if you really need to vent, talk to God about it. He's always listening and he won't judge you or use your words against you later. So the next time you're tempted to spill all the tea about your new relationship, remember Joseph and use some wisdom. Testify about what God has done for you, but don't give away all the juicy details. Keep some things between you and your partner and trust that God will continue to bless your relationship in his perfect timing. Now, I know it's tempting to share your newfound joy with your friends and family, but trust me, it's not always the wisest choice. Speaking when you're angry opens the door to sin, causes strife, and turns you into a fool. Proverbs 29 verse 11. But speaking when you're excited can be just as dangerous. You might be wondering, but why can't I share my happiness with my friends? Don't they deserve to know? Well, the truth is not everyone will be happy for you. People who are driven by the flesh are often envious, full of jealousy, bitterness, and hatred. And the last thing you want is to have someone rain on your parade or even worse, plan evil against you when you least expect it. So before you start telling your friends about your relationship, observe them closely. Are they truly happy for you? Do they revere God and celebrate his blessings? Or are they just pretending to be your friend? Sometimes it's better to keep things to yourself and protect your relationship from negative influences. Remember, too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. It might take every fruit of the Spirit to make it happen, but when you control your tongue, you'll come out on top every time. Plus, you'll save yourself from the pain of words that can't be taken back no matter how much you regret them. And don't let the devil push you off the line of walking in love. He's always trying to get you out of alignment so he can steal your blessings from you. Instead, hold your tongue and listen to the Holy Spirit. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. James 1 verse 19. So whether it's a Proverbs 26 4 moment or a Proverbs 26 5 moment, let the Holy Spirit guide you and give you the words to speak. When you do, you'll never let anger or excitement lead you into sin again. In conclusion, remember that not everyone deserves to know about your new relationship. Keep your mouth shut and protect your blessings. And always listen to the Holy Spirit before you speak. When we fall in love, we're often drawn to commit more and more to the relationship with our partner over time. One of the problems, however, is that relationship crises soon begin to rock the boat, and not many relationships survive these crises when they show up. You may love someone, but still not be able to sustain a relationship with them. Many people have watched the people they once loved go on to marry someone else after the relationship failed. And even though God strictly forbids his people from divorce, unless on the serious grounds of unfaithfulness or infidelity, many marriages still crumble because of one mistake or another. You need to know that God wants to teach you, as his child, how important it is for you to make him the pillar and center of your life. This is the only way you can get the most out of the blessings he's reserved for you. God loves you and will not give up on you because of any shortcomings that led to past failures in your relationships. He promised to never leave you or forsake you. Hence, his love is always beckoning you with open arms, awaiting your return to him. When you realize your need for God, and you honestly admit that you're willing to take responsibility and follow his instructions, you position yourself to experience restoration what most single people fail to realize is that with God, it's not too late to get back what you've lost. One thing about restoration is that it's multidimensional. 
What do I mean? Let's take a side journey and observe the life of Job, the servant of God. He lost everything he had. Some were stolen, some were completely destroyed, and others died. Yet the Bible says that God later restored everything that Job lost. How did that happen? Did the dead come back to life? Did the robbers return the stolen animals? Did the possessions consumed by the fire rise out of the ashes? How did God restore things? Restoration can involve the return of what was lost, like the prodigal son or the lost sheep of Saul's father. However, it doesn't stop there. With God, restoration can involve new things that become better replacements than what we lost. So if we're able to bring that into our conversation today, it means that God can bring back a relationship that failed in the past. Or if that wouldn't work for any reason, He can guide you into a new relationship with a better experience and future than your previous relationship. So how does God guide you into restoration? How do you know that God is bringing back someone you love after a failed relationship? How do you know you're about to meet someone you'll love even if you failed in the past? Well, here are some signs. When you see these signs, God's showing you that He wants to bring the two of you together or He's about to bless you with someone with whom you'll find love again. Number one, a sign that God will restore your relationship is that you'll feel a newer sense of love and attraction to the person. This is two-dimensional. It can involve developing a love for a new person in your life or a fresh feeling of love for someone you used to be with but with whom the relationship failed. Please note that God will never do this with people who are already married. This means that He'll never put a feeling of love for another person apart from your husband or wife to whom you're married. That would be contradicting His word and encouraging married people to have relationships outside their marriage. However, this can happen with single unmarried individuals who He's still developing into strong blessings for oncoming generations. You see, when crises begin to rock relationships, love and affection for each other begin to wane. I agree that nobody likes to be blamed for a relationship problem or failure. Everyone wants to be proud to be pointed to as the reason a relationship survives. Also, I believe you want to have a relationship that lasts. No one wants to fall in love with someone only to lose the person because you didn't know how to avoid certain mistakes. Hence, when God begins to teach you and help you recognize yourself and to prepare you for the right person, He will begin to put love in your heart for them. If it's your spouse, you'll begin to notice a new sense of love and affection for them. You'll begin to find yourself desiring to be with your partner and being happy around them. This is something you may have lost over time in your marriage. If you're unmarried, you may begin to sense this towards the person with whom your relationship didn't work or with the new person God's brought. It's a sign that God may want to bring you two together in a stronger bond one of the strengths of a restored relationship is the couple's love. They have seen the worst of each other and are now more than willing to face life together. Permit me to say that if God's in your relationship, this will always happen, no matter how far you two get from each other. Number two, another sign that God will restore your relationship is that He'll begin to give you visions of a future together, unlike with anyone else. You need to know that beyond your physical companionship, one of the major reasons God brings two people together is for the future He has for the two of you. One of the effects of a failed relationship is that you both may no longer see a future together. Maybe because of the actions, habits, or decisions of one person. The person whom you love may no longer wish to continue with you. Like I said earlier, you can love someone and still not see a future with them. However, if after your failed relationship, God begins to show you a future with this person, either the one from your old relationship or the new person He's bringing into your life, then He's about to give you restoration. Abraham could let go of Hagar and their child Ishmael because God showed him that his future was with Sarah, his wife, and she would be the one to bear the child of promise, not Hagar or any other woman. When God gives you a vision of His designed future for you with someone, He uses that to validate His agenda for both your lives 
and to strengthen your convictions of being with each other. So, you can rest assured that the restoration will happen, even if it isn't looking like it will right now. God will make it happen at the right time. You just stay in step with Him and be ready to do whatever He asks you to do. Number three, a third sign is a better understanding of yourself and how to manage situations, either with the old partner or with the new partner God's bringing into your life. One proof that you're not ready for a new relationship or restoration of a God-ordained former relationship is a lack of understanding of the root cause of the problems that caused your past relationship failures. However, on the other hand, when you develop a better judgment and understanding of your mistakes, of yourself, of your partner, and of situations in such a way that if they were to arise again, you'd know how to handle them. That is a sign that God's about to give you that love or passion you once lost. So be on the lookout. When you notice that you're quicker to respond and handle situations in a more mature way than you used to, and when you've noticed that you've developed stamina to forbear and manage things better than you used to, then God is bringing restoration with that person again. Lastly, number four. The last sign is a deeper respect and value for the person than before. Just like love and affection, respect often declines in a relationship when things aren't working out. In fact, one of the root causes of many failed relationships is the decline or complete absence of respect and value for each other. You would struggle to stay in a relationship where you're no longer being respected or valued, and so would your partner. When there's little or no respect and value, love cannot thrive, and conflict and disagreement will abound. However, when God wants to restore your relationship, He will plan a growing respect and deeper value for this person in your heart. He will open your eyes to start seeing how important they are to your life and God's plan for you. He'll open your eyes to see how much benefit they bring into your life when they're with you. As you begin to see these signs, don't be afraid or hesitant in stepping out in readiness to take your place when the opportunity comes. If you resist God or refuse to recognize these signs because of your pride, selfishness, or fear, you may be shutting yourself out of the chance prepared by God to bring you into fulfillment. No one knows the hearts of anyone like God. Hence, when God wants to bring someone back into your life, He knows what suits you more than you can imagine. Hence, accepting them is declaring your complete trust in God's wisdom and good intentions towards you. If there's one thing you can be certain of, is that in this journey of faith, at one point or another, God will expect us to pull away from the crowds, pull away from what is familiar, and walk alone. Many times in the Bible, we see God calling different people to walk alone. We see Moses being called up into the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, and God specifically asks Moses to go alone. We see the prophet Elijah being called into the wilderness, where he was alone. In this case, God separated Elijah from the society to protect him from the wrath of King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And though he didn't have the comfort of food and shelter, God provided for him, and he was fed by ravens. Abraham was also asked to leave his homeland and leave all that he knew and to go to another land, which God said he would show him. Though he was with his wife and nephew, he was separated from the rest of his family and asked to leave a land where he was already prospering. He actually didn't even know where he was going. He just had to trust that God would lead him. Jesus Christ, when he walked on this earth, often pulled away from the crowds and went to be alone. Jesus often retreated from the crowds to spend time with God. In one of those occasions, Jesus spent 40 days alone in the wilderness as he prayed and fasted. All these examples in the Bible show us that separation is a common part of our walk with God. You see, there are reasons when God will separate you from all that is familiar. There are times when he will remove you from your comfort zone. When these seasons come, 
Don't be scared. Put your trust in God. After all, He has promised to never leave you nor forsake you. These moments when you have to walk alone are the moments that God uses to prepare you for the next stage of your destiny. So, there is really no need to fear. A story is told in the Bible of a boy called David, who later became one of the greatest leaders in Israel. David spent time alone tending to his father's sheep out in the field. In this time, his brothers didn't think much of him. Even his father didn't think much of him. But God had allowed the separation because he had to prepare David to be the king of Israel. In this time alone, tending to the sheep. David learnt many things. He learnt to face dangerous animals with a weapon in one hand and God's power in the other. In this time, God taught David how to have faith that would help him to defeat intimidating predators that were trying to harm his flock. In this time when David had no one else to turn to, God taught him to depend on him for every situation in 1 Samuel 17, 34-37. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. This season of walking alone prepared David to be one of the best soldiers and kings in Israel in defeating many of their enemies. Because David experienced God's help in solitude, when he was fighting off bears and lions, he learned that God could help him win all his battles. David was able to fight where the armies of Israel feared, including defeating the giant Goliath, who had taunted Israel. Because he had experienced God when he was alone, he was confident to face life knowing God was with him. In his time alone, David learned to depend on God. He learned that God was a reliable God and that he was there with him to help him to fight his battles. Being alone is the perfect time for God to show you who he is. It provides the right environment for you to build a relationship with God and allows you to hear God for yourself. It removes distractions and helps you to focus on what is important. It sounds strange that on one hand, you long to have a partner and to be in a relationship, but on the other hand, God may be leading you to be alone so he can prepare you for that future partner. The truth is, walking alone allows you to cultivate some habits that you will need when you get a partner. For instance, your time alone will teach you to run to God first for solutions before running to other people. So if your relationship goes through some rocky times, you will have learnt to go to God first. Having a partner is a sensitive time, and taking your problems to God first is one of those things that can save you from a failed relationship. Many people want to tell their friends or family members all the wrong things that are happening in their relationships. Some people will even go as far as posting their issues on social media. This can leave a partner feeling exposed and embarrassed. But the truth is, many issues can be solved in prayer and through God's wisdom before they're exposed to other people. Being alone also allows you to understand yourself better. It allows God to heal you where you may have been wounded by other relationships. We often get into relationships with baggage from past relationships. We carry these with us, and it can bring unnecessary troubles into our relationships. But when you allow God to first deal with your issues, 
before he gives you a partner, then you will be a much better partner for your future relationship. When you know yourself better and you have your own personal relationship with God, you're able to eliminate insecurities and you learn to be confident in who God has made you to be. It is said that two people who are growing in their relationship with God grow closer together because they're both working to know God and God becomes the uniting factor. Walking alone will give you clarity. Other voices and opinions are silenced. You see, whenever you are close to your miracle, the enemy is also not happy and he will try to confuse you. The devil will try to confuse you with wrong advice or bringing the wrong partner your way or any other tactic to derail you from God's purpose for your life. When Jesus had completed his 40 days in the wilderness, the enemy tried to confuse him with many false promises. But because Jesus had spent some time alone praying and meditating on the word of God, the devil was not able to deceive him. When God puts you in a season of walking alone, don't fight it. Enjoy it. It's in this place that God will teach you to differentiate between the right partner and the counterfeit ones. Walking alone with God will open your eyes to the lies of the enemy and give you the boldness you need to face your future. Always remember that God is not a sadist. He is not separating you so that you can feel lonely. He actually is separating you so that he can speak to you and prepare you for the future. Even in that separation, God will be closer than you think, so you will not really have to walk alone. In Proverbs 18, 24, it says, One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. God will be closer to you than a brother. What many people don't understand is that getting a partner is a very important stage in our lives. It is one that we can't take lightly and we need to prepare for it. It should be a lifetime commitment, so it's a decision that we should not take lightly. It calls for self-reflection. It calls for prayer and seeking God's face. It's a decision that will affect you for the rest of your life. That is why God wants to prepare you for it. God wants your relationship to last a lifetime, and he wants you to have the best. It may require that you spend less time meeting up with friends, and perhaps instead, use that time to learn more about relationships through the Bible, other books, podcasts, or even other successful relationships around you. God may require that you go into some time of praying and fasting so that you can hear from him concerning different aspects of your life. Sometimes, he may separate us to reduce our dependency on others and increase our dependency on him. It may require you to have a season where you get off the dating scene. You may feel that you have to date many people in order to find the right one. And you may wonder how you will find a partner if you're not actively out there dating or looking for one. His word says in Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We won't always understand how God works, but we must trust that he knows what he is doing and that his plan is better and higher than our own. In Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, the Bible asks us to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. God will keep your partner for you until the right time. You don't have to worry about how you will meet him or her. As you live for God and serve his purposes, he will make your path straight. Live life God's way. Don't fear and watch God prepare you for your partner. 
He will make all things beautiful in His time. You need to always remember that marriage is a glorious institution in God's eyes. A blessing He instituted from the beginning of time for a man and a woman to enjoy the rest of their lives. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 18.22, He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. And it says how marriage is and should be in Genesis 2.24. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. In marriage, two people with different identities, backgrounds, callings, and destinies find a point of unity where everything about them fuses into one. It is such a beautiful miracle to behold, something we rarely see today, because the whole meaning of the marital union has been lost in modern society. For you to have the experience of a God-ordained marriage, you have to understand and operate by the principles of God in your marital journey. You see, God has a purpose for marriage between His children and also has a purpose within their marriage. Because most people don't understand this today, the common trend of broken and failing marriages continues to rise and reign. However, if you open up and submit to God's order, then you can prepare for a marriage that'll last the test of time. Don't forget that God's plan for you is good. He is very much aware of the struggles and disappointments you may have faced to get to this point. Sometimes our experiences leave us doubting our worth and trying to quench our reason for living. However, you must believe in and discover the treasures that God has placed inside you. Remember, the Bible says that God knew each of us before we were even conceived in the womb. It also tells us that God took His eternal treasures and placed them inside vessels made from the earth, that is, our bodies made from clay. 2 Corinthians 4.7 But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. God knows everything about you and the potential within you. Don't forget that He put you on earth. This must mean that He has a plan, and certainly that plan is for good and not for evil. Sometimes the process may be hard and complicated, but you must never forget that His intentions are for you to arrive at a place of peace and rest. Psalm 66:12. You let people ride over our heads, We went through fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. This works like a woman in labor. At first, she's in pain as she pushes to get the baby out. She cries and pushes herself to her limit. Sometimes, she contemplates giving up, but the joy of bringing life into the world gives her strength to push time and time again. Then, the moment the baby's born, the pains are overshadowed by the presence of the child she finds rest in that feeling of success. You have the responsibility to seek God from here in faith and complete trust in His will for you. It's left for you to find out what He wants you to do next and how to go about it. Many times we think that we know what's best for us, that we know what marriage is, who exactly to marry, or the perfect time to be married. But the undeniable truth is that the idea in your mind is greatly influenced by the world's definitions of marriage and its pressures on you to walk after that system. Some people who think they know what God's idea of marriage is are sadly only thinking about sexual experiences, romantic movie influences, public displays of affection for likes on social media and other trivial ideas. These things are far from God's own idea and intention for marriage in general and may have little to nothing to do with His purpose for your partner who's about to show up in your life. That's why you need to look to God and find out what He's saying about your marriage or who He wants you to marry before you take any step that would end in regret. The Bible tells us not to lean on our own understanding, but to trust God to guide us in all things as we commit them into His hands. Proverbs 3, 5-6 Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, 
and he will make your paths straight. One of the greatest risks you can take with your life is to trust your instinct for something you have no idea about. There are more chances of failing and getting lost than there are in getting it right. And Jesus told us that he'll give us a comforter and a guide who is the Holy Spirit. With the help of the Holy Spirit, you, the child of God, have the greater edge than the one without the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will guide you in all truth. He will shine his light on your ways and help you make the right decisions, as well as empower you to see them through to the end. With the Holy Spirit, you will overcome confusion and fear. Instead, he'll give you clarity concerning the will of God for your marriage and spouse, whom God is bringing your way. You need to know this and accept it. God's not far from you. If you're trusting God over your marital life and asking God to send you the right person according to his will, it's time you start paying attention. This is a wake-up call and confirmation to you. God has heard you and he is telling you that this person is coming. You need to prepare yourself to meet them and not miss them. You need to prepare yourself in the spirit so that you can recognize them and not lump them in with others because they don't look like how you expect. It's time for you to pay attention to the voice and guidance of God. Sometimes God can be speaking, but you're not listening. Marriage is something you're going to have to go into for the rest of your life. So you must be very careful about who you choose to marry, because your fulfillment or regret depends on it. You want to ensure that the person you choose is God's will for your life. God has used everything so far to equip and prepare you for the great things ahead of you. Giving up on him because of delays, difficulties, and challenges will rob you of seeing him work in your life. However, when you are sure and believe that God has something in store for you, you will not give up easily. And how do you show that you trust God to confirm what he's saying through this video? These are two signs which confirm you trust God to fulfill his promise, as well as signs that God will do what he's promised to give you. One the consistency of your prayer life. Consistency takes discipline. Discipline is possible through focus on a goal. I stumbled on a video on social media where the speaker said that everyone doesn't have a problem with discipline as much as they do choosing what they give their discipline to. For instance, he said most people don't have a problem maintaining their Netflix subscription for years. They don't have a problem meeting up with friends every week at the same time consistently. They don't have a problem with following their favorite football club's business, and so on. This is the same with prayer consistency. The hard truth is that you're committed to anything that gives you satisfaction. If you care about something deeply enough, you will give yourself to it. If you enjoy the entertainment and pleasure something gives you, you won't need so much inspiration to continue. When you truly believe that God is your source and without him, you will fail and not survive the wicked plans of the enemy for you, you will pray more. This is what prayer does. It tells God that you need him. It tells God that you admit you don't know what to do and need his direction or else you'll fail. What most of us don't know or realize yet is that each time we pray, we become more spiritually sensitive and in tune with God so that it's easier to identify the will of God for us. You see, we are moved by outward appearances and the things we hear. God, on the other hand, sees the hearts, thoughts, and intentions of everyone. He knows who's right for you and who isn't. Through prayer, you open yourself up to be led by God. When you begin to pray about the person God will give you as a partner, you're showing God that you're getting ready for them. When God also places more marriage-related prayers in your heart, know that he's bringing someone your way. Your prayerfulness is confirmation. Along with it comes a huge wave of peace. When you pray more, you'll fear less. When you pray more, you grow more confident in the ability of God. That is, your faith becomes stronger. 2. Patience with God Another very important sign of your trust in God to confirm his word to you is the increase in your patience. Hebrews 6.12 says, We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. 
One of the things required in our walk with God, as well as to build and sustain any kind of relationship, especially marriage relationships, is patience. Patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit. You see, God will never lead you in a hurry, so you must never be in a hurry to make drastic decisions in your life. Like I said earlier, one of the signs that you're on the same page with God in prayer is peace. One of the things peace does is to keep you at rest as you patiently wait for God to fulfill His Word. You may not know this, but all the no's you've had to endure have been God's way of teaching you to be patient until you stop being hasty. At the beginning, you were always quick to make conclusions based on your feelings, impressions, and thoughts. However, this kept exploding in your face until you learned to wait a little longer to see how things turned out. That was God using what you went through to mature you. Patience with God, with yourself and with others, is a sign that you're ready for God to bring the right person your way. It's also a sign that you trust Him to do it. It means you won't see and jump at the next exciting thing that takes place in your life. This is an encouragement for you that God is by your side in everything you do, every day of your life. So you should not be afraid to make choices, and that will include choosing a partner. If you're patient to hear the voice of God in other areas of life, it will not be difficult for you to hear what God has to say about your relationship and marriage. Don't worry. Soon you will be glad you waited and trusted God because the right person will come and God will give you more peace than you ever imagined. It will indeed be like the rest that comes after the pain of labor. Very fulfilling.